I'm contributing to the session that is talking on the changing paradigm of lymphoma treatment um, and I'm particularly focusing on uh, introducing new molecules into lymphoma therapy, particularly immunotherapy uh, is what I'll be focusing on in, in my discussion. And uh, you know, non-Hodgkin lymphoma really has quite a glorious past of immunotherapy because rituximab really was one of the first immunotherapy drugs brought into standard practice. Um, it's been approved for over 15 years now. And really it goes from strength to strength in many ways in the B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma world. Uh, the very first trial that established rituximab uh, in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma frontline treatment com combining with CHOP uh, was done by the French GILA group uh, many years ago now and the long-term follow-up data with median follow-up now of over 10 years has confirmed a impressive and persistent overall survival advantage. So really with a lot of confidence we can say that introducing rituximab has saved many lives uh, from lymphoma uh, over the last 15 years or so. So that's been a tremendous success for immunotherapy. At least I would call rituximab immun immunotherapy. Some people wouldn't because it directly targets the cancer cell rather than directly targeting the immune system. But one of its mechanisms of action is to uh, introduce ADCC, antidependent complement, uh, anti antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity uh, to the cancer cell. So that's been a tremendous success. And actually anti-CD20 therapy is, is developing um, really at a, a very impressive rate. So there's a new anti-CD20 antibody now, abinutuzumab, that's approved for CLL in combination with chlorambucil for the less fit patients. That's now standard of care. Uh, that it's, that's also been combined with chemotherapy and frontline follicular lymphoma and has shown a progression-free survival advantage, although no overall survival advantage. Um, although it's not all a success story for abinutuzumab in that combining it with CHOP uh, and comparing it with our CHOP in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma up front has shown no difference at all. So in some contexts, it does appear to be a, a more effective approach, albeit with slightly excess toxicities. Um, but in other contexts, it hasn't shown to be superior. There are other molecules, other antibodies targeting other B-cell antigens. In, and in my talk, I'll be talking about CD32B, uh, which many people have never heard of. I hadn't heard of it until quite recently. Uh, and that's an FC gamma receptor which is found on B cells and it's thought to be, there's some very nice science actually suggesting it's involved in rituximab resistance. So the idea is that if we combine an antibody against CD32B, which may have a fixie in its own right, with rituximab, we may see synergistic activity and there's a phase one trial currently happening in the UK to test that approach. So I think that's quite exciting. And another very exciting development actually in this field are the antibody drug conjugates. So we've had uh, brentuximab vedotin, which is an anti-CD30 antibody drug conjugate for some time now in Hodgkin lymphoma and relapsed anaplastic large cell lymphoma. It's very much standard of care now for relapsed Hodgkin and ALCL. Um, and that's shown to be quite effective, but there are, have been recent developments in the technology of antibody drug conjugates. So we now have polituzumab uh, vedotin, which is an anti-79B uh, antibody drug conjugate. Um, and there's some data actually being presented at ASH, which is now being published in abstract form, um, showing that uh, bendamustine rituximab versus bendamustine rituximab polituzumab in relapsed refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, so very difficult situation to treat, is showing a, a fairly impressive overall survival advantage. So these drugs, these antibody drug conjugates are, are very impressive. And uh, uh, another development in ADCC technology I'll be talking briefly about um, is using a new toxin, uh, which is uh, a lot more potent than, for example, MMAE, which is the toxin that's been used in brentuximab and polituzumab. Um, plus, there's some more um, clever technology which allows specific conjugation uh, sites to be linked with the ADCC, allowing a much more precise number of drugs per antibody, and that improves the, the efficiency of these drugs. And there's a drug, for example, called ADCT402, which again is being presented at ASH and the data's out now in abstract form, showing that even as a single agent in relapsed refractory diffuse large B, they're seeing some very nice responses, over 50%, many of which are quite durable. Um, so really the immunotherapy world in terms of antibody and ADCC is very active. Perhaps the more traditional immunotherapy drugs like PD-1 inhibitors, CTLA-4 inhibitors, they have now an established role in Hodgkin lymphoma, showing very active and quite durable uh, remissions uh, when used as single agents. Much more difficult to find a niche in non-Hodgkin lymphoma though. There was a big study looking at nivolumab in relapsed refractory diffuse large B and it showed a, a rather disappointing response rate of less than 10% in that group. 
So I think really if that is to find a role in, in what is our area, main area of unmet need, relapsed refractory diffuse large B, it's going to have to be with intelligent combinations, perhaps HDAC inhibitors, perhaps demethylating agents, which may serve to increase MHC expression or possibly increase uh, oncoantigen expression by the tumour cells. Um, but there are some very specific subtypes of non-Hodgkin lymphoma which do show activity with these drugs, such as primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. Surprisingly, perhaps primary CNS lymphoma appears to be very responsive to PD-1 inhibitors, even though they're given systemically, uh, and primary testicular lymphoma also. So I think we will find some niche areas where PD-1 inhibitors are active in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, as well as, as I say, re really revolutionising the field of Hodgkin lymphoma.